so <clears throat> very little thought or skill for it. Um, as I understand it, about eight years ago, when Dr. Ann took that plunge, or perhaps I should say that sore, and she tells me there's a tailwind today, and that's why it was waiting for me when I got to the airport. So I take that just a little bit further. Not only does he do it himself, but he influences other people to do the same thing. I hold the record at the University of Illinois Airport for bouncing a plane higher than any student they have ever had out there. <laughs> Dr. Han comes to us to tell us some of the things that we wanted to know this morning. He's going to speak to us on um, what research has to say about the effectiveness of the core program. Dr. Han. Thank you, Dr. Han. Do I understand this thing is hooked up, Evelyn, or not? I'm uh, picking it up before the kids come there. Just so I don't have to listen to it again, is all I ask. <laughs> You know, uh, not apropos of the core or anything else, but uh, yesterday I happened to be at another institution and uh, a, a lady who is the president of the Illinois, the Indiana Teachers Association, or whatever the, whatever the full name is, uh, told a little story that uh, I liked, and maybe you like it too, perhaps you've already heard it. It's about, uh, oh, it seems setting was down in, uh, what's that place in Florida where Ringling Brothers uh, has their winter headquarters? Sarasota. And they just gotten a new lion, and he was really a rip-tailed snorter. And of course, they wanted to, you know, team him and get in there and train him a bit, and their top trainers just could not get into that cage. And finally, they uh, got the Clyde Beatty, however you say the name, you know, this famous animal trainer, and he couldn't even get near the cage. The lion almost tore it down. Then it seems that Marilyn Monroe was visiting the Camp and came along. You heard the story? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, said, Well, let me try it. And she walked up. The lion uh, calmed down right away. She got in the cage, and the lion put his paws around her and hugged her close and put his cheek against hers. And they turned to Clyde Bailey and said, Well, we're certainly ashamed of you. Why couldn't you do that? And he says, Well, I couldn't get that damn lion out of there. <laughs> Well, that sort of tickled me. <laughs> I'd like to give a slight bit of uh, personal testimony. I guess that's in order when you come to Indiana. Uh, I, uh, I became persuaded of the validity of the core uh, years ago on the basis that I suspect is by long odds the most enduring, namely on the basis of one's own youngster. Uh, we have a son, our only child, knock me down if I called him that. He's 31 now. Uh, he's a lot bigger than I am. But when Tom, our son, uh, was in the third and the fourth grade, especially the fourth grade in Palo Alto, I teach at Stanford those days, he was the closest thing to the pure form of the unadulterated academic bum that I think I have ever encountered. I've seen lots of them in my time. Uh, that kid, uh, one month was tardy twice a day for every school day, and he was absent whenever he dared to be. In other words, school to him was an extremely distasteful place, and uh, he had a fourth grade teacher that uh, is one of the really bad teachers that I think I've ever met. Well, this was in the Palo Alto school. I recall getting a note, so we getting a note from her, which reflects on us much more than her, uh, one day. Uh, along with his report card, which was beautifully engraved with lots of red letters, uh, saying that uh, our son was next to hopeless, particularly in respect to science, that he had no scientific interest whatsoever, and there wasn't a thing he could do with it. Well, it just happened in uh, the same mail, or at least the same day, if not the same mail, we got a notice from the public health department in Palo Alto saying, in effect, uh, either get out of town or get rid of that terrific menagerie that you've got there in your backyard, which it was a public menace. Now, this lad was bringing home particularly uh, crippled animals of all sorts, and we had almost every variety that you could find in a place like Palo Alto. But still, he had no scientific interest as far as the school knew, and of course, we were guilty of not having made it known. Well, the point was we elected to get out of town. <laughs> and, uh, and we left within a matter of 
We had two weeks, and we got out within 10 days, and we went out uh, beyond the Stanford Golf Course, if you know this country, it's across the San Francisco Creek there, and now it's all built up solid. For those days, there are only a few houses out there. It's a low rental area, and most of the people who lived out there were artisans of one sort or another. I think it was one of the professors, a queer duck that lived out there. And uh, the only place we could find, we knew nothing about the school. There was a country, what you what could call a country school, the Las Lomitas School, a poor teacher school, about a mile and a quarter uh, down that road. And uh, we hadn't been out there uh, more than, I would guess, uh, a matter of a couple of months until uh, uh, Tom said one morning that he just had to get to school early. Uh, he had to be over there. He going to want to be over there around about 7.30 or something. Well, I thought this was a picnic he was going on. This isn't school. Uh, because of his past history. And so I uh, did something I suppose a good father shouldn't do. I shadowed him. But sure enough, he was headed for school. And uh, then I got interested in the school and uh, found out some things about it. And during that youngster's uh, uh, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, he had the closest thing to what Albert he calls the pure core type of teaching that I think I have ever seen. Uh, the same teacher went right through these last four years with the group, and there were no bells. The kids uh, uh, certainly were heavily involved in the purposing and the planning. Uh, of course, some parents uh, didn't know what the results were. They they had they kept a pretty careful tab on their results. Their kids all went to the Sequoia Union High School in Redwood City, and our son did too later. And the results there were very good. Uh, they academically, uh, these kids IQ for IQ were excelling in academic performance. Youngsters coming from the other contributory schools, and then when it came to the uh, leadership spot, and Camilla Lowe was now a professor at Wisconsin very brilliant person in my judgment, one of the half dozen leading people in the guidance movement in this country. Camilla Lowe at that time was dean of girls at that institution. And uh, she tells, told me many times that she could spot a kid from the Las Lomitas School a mile <coughs> off. They weren't cocky or brash, but they knew their way around and they simply uh, uh, ran away in time with the leadership spot. Now it happened that Sequoia Union High School also had a core set up. They didn't call it core, they called it home and family living. You know, of course, the name shift all over the country. And our youngster had uh, two years of that at uh, Sequoia, uh, and with very good results. Well, this school, this Los Alamitas school, and that high school completely changed our son's attitude toward schooling and toward himself in respect of schooling, and I can report now that he has his master's degree. Uh, whereas, uh, the time he was in the fourth grade, I would have been a plug nickel if we got him through the eighth grade and be by the grace of God, and I didn't know what else. But he certainly takes divine aid to do it. So as a, as a father, uh, I have had the kind of uh, first-hand direct experience. I've seen what it's done to a youngster. And uh, that, to me, has been uh, uh, the most persuasive sort of influence that I can possibly imagine. Now, I don't want to say anything more about that, but I couldn't resist saying a word about it. Now, there are five or six things that I'd like to call attention to, and uh, I'd be very happy if, if this were old stuff to everybody, and perhaps it is. And if it is, if you're like I am, you'd like to hear the articles of faith recited, particularly when they are accompanied by works. And uh, what I'm going to call attention to are factual studies, uh, which bear on the effectiveness of the core course in respect to uh, particularly the academic achievements of youngsters. I think I'll start. Uh, if you don't have this particular publication, maybe you've all got it, from New York City. This is the publication that the uh, curriculum uh, department of the city gets out. Many of you know uh, Bill Bristow, Dr. Bristow, who's the head of the curriculum department. And you undoubtedly know that New York City is a hard-boiled place uh, they have large schools. Uh, they are up against a fairly hard-boiled clientele. And uh, by and large, as I know teachers in many of those uh, schools, uh, they are not uh, at all the sort that's too easily persuaded. But they have got a number of high schools and junior high schools in New York City that have been working with the Corps since the late 30s. 
Well, this happens to be an issue that uh, called Curriculum and Materials, put out by the Board of Education. This happens to be the November, December 1954 issue. So you see it's about a year and a half old now. And uh, most of it's dev devoted to a description of the core courses in the New York City uh, senior and junior high schools. What they are actually like, I'm going to skip that. It runs on for several pages. And this isn't a textbook sort of stuff. Now, you've all read textbooks in education, perhaps you've written them as long as I have. And you know that there tends to uh, be a species of wish thinking that gets itself translated into paragraphs that sound as though they were descriptions. And in textbooks, uh, frequently the children are all reasonable, the parents are just begging for enlightenment, all the teachers are highly cooperative, everything just goes beautifully. And then you go out and try to apply it, and uh, you find things that think that way at all. Well, this isn't that sort of stuff at all. This is uh, material that is prepared for the Board of Education by an extremely responsible person and uh, is not at all polluted uh, with eyewash. Well, I'm going to skip all the description, but I'm going to start by calling attention to uh, what they have reported to the Board. These are generalizations, and I want to get more specific. These are generalized facts that the uh, Bureau of Research, headed up by J. Wing Wrightstone, and I'll have more to say about him later, uh, based on what the Bureau of Research, Educational Research in New York City, has reported on the basis of its comparative study. So now I'm going to take a chance of boring you by reading uh, about one and a half columns, uh, headed in the one instance evaluation and the other other learning outcomes. The Board of Superintendents' action in accepting the core program, it was put in first as an experimental thing, which is smart, I think, in uh, one or two places, Midwood High School particularly, and tried out, and then and checked very carefully uh, by the Bureau of Educational Research, by Wrightstone's outfit. And as they found their results good, their comparative results, then it spread to other schools, and now uh, this has the formal approval of the Board. And that's what they mean here. The Board of Superintendents' action in accepting the core program is based on the conclusions presented in the report by the Bureau of Educational Research. And this uh, report uh, has two parts. The first one is summarized in uh, three paragraphs, the second part in five uh, very short paragraphs. They're sentence paragraphs, actually. One, the evidence from standardized tests indicates that pupils in the core program have achieved competence in the basic skills as effectively as pupils under more conventional high school instructional programs. That's an understatement in terms of their own evidence. And in a few minutes, I'm going to draw on the Wrightstone Prolano study uh, made at the Midwood High School on the basis of two years of core work in two different core groups, and a comparison right within the same school. But uh, I think this is all right. They are putting it ultra conservatively to the Board of Education. Two. The evidence from attitude scales, sociometric techniques, and observations indicates that the social and personal adjustment of the pupils is served as effectively, if not more so, by the core program as by the conventional program. That, if not more so, they're covering up there. The, the, their results show the youngsters perform better on the measures that Wrightstone and his associates had devised, but none of those measures, I mean, we're in our infancy as far as the device, even though infancy goes with measures are. Concern. And they all have a relatively large margin of uh, error of measurement. And the results uh, show that the kids in the core make greater gains on these instruments, but the error of measurement is large. And, and then when they apply statistical techniques, they aren't able to say that it's significant uh, much better than at about the 5% level, which is pretty good, however. Three, the observations made, as well as the self evaluation by the core teachers, indicate that the core teachers compared with conventional subject matter teachers know more about their pupils and that the friendly climate of the core classroom emphasizes guidance toward adjustment to high school. This is the junior high people, obviously. Also noted were the high morale and professional alertness of core program teachers. Now the second part of this. The program evaluation is more advanced in the senior high school. It began first there in the senior high school, which is a bit out of the ordinary. At least as far as Illinois is concerned, we have much more of this in our junior highs than we have in our seniors. The 
program evaluation is more advanced in the senior high schools than the junior high schools because planned evaluation has been in operation for a longer period. Results at the junior high school level, however, have been comparable. Now they talk about some summaries, and here are games to which they call the attention of the board. Uh, one, participation in the core program has contributed measurably to the professional growth of the teachers involved, as well as to the stimulation of many teachers outside the program. Two, core teachers know their pupils much better and are much more deeply interested in individual differences and in the learning difficulties of children. Three, the core curriculum has moved its teachers forward to a more effective integration of subject areas. Four, the core program also has caused teachers to re-examine their teaching techniques and to seek a greater variety of learning experiences for children. Excuse me, I just have to think of something I've got to make a note on. I don't say something about Mobile, Alabama, well, somebody asked me to do so later. I had no notes on that, and this I want to say this reminds me of it. And five, the core program has increased the holding power of the school, especially for the pupils of low academic ability. And then they have a paragraph here, a headed other learning outcomes. Learning outcomes as a result of the core have been stated thus. Students in the core program have made considerable gains in personal and social adjustments have acquired a degree of articulateness and self-confidence in expressing themselves that is much greater than is customarily found among ninth-year students. They reveal a greater degree of willingness and ability to do independent work in solving problems and are more familiar with the techniques of getting at sources of information than are most pupils in traditional classes. Core techniques have succeeded in motivating the learning process for many pupils to a far greater degree. All right, that is from this the publication that I instanced, Curriculum and Materials for November, December 1954 of the New York Board of Education. Now, lest I forget it, let me say a word about uh, Mobile, Alabama. I hadn't even thought of it as I was preparing these simple little notes that I'm following here. Uh, uh, Mr. Raymond Wilson, Dr. Raymond Wilson, who is now the executive secretary of uh, whatever the equivalent of the North Central Association is down there in the southeast. I've forgotten the name of it. Yeah, he now has his offices in Atlanta, Georgia. He is the head man for that. But up until uh, he took that job about a year and a half or so ago, he was for, oh, I would guess eight or ten years, the principal of the Murphy High School in Mobile, Alabama, which is the largest high school south of the Mason-Dixon line, about 5,000 students. And uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Wilson, now Dr. Wilson, happened to come up to Illinois to do graduate work, and uh, I happened to become his advisor, and uh, he, he was interested in doing for his uh, thesis project uh, the working toward, and it's successful in that, to that extent, the installing of and the appraising of the uh, core curriculum, the core course, in the Murphy. And so he came up and uh, spent uh, a couple of summers reading in the field and building what might be called a construct, the sort of thing that an engineer is going to throw a bridge across the Wabash would certainly have a construct in respect to his materials and processes and everything else. So what the Wilson did was to think through the problem of group dynamics and all the rest. Uh, how should one ideally go about this? And uh, got it in line with the best theory and then went home and attempted to put it into practice, keeping a log, or for the most part a daily log, of how things went. And of course, among other things that he had postulated for himself, was the laying in of fire insurance. In other words, getting before and after evidence. Uh, looking forward to the day, inevitably, when people will say the kids can't spell like they used to put, and they can't write like they used to put, and so on and so on. And so it's always the better part of wisdom to have fire insurance of this sort and other sorts too. Well, what happened down there in uh, Mobile, and it's quite instructive, I think, to read uh, Wilson's uh, thesis. They started out in that large high school with some, I, I recall it, seven or eight teachers. And part of his philosophy was nobody to be forced, or however subtly. Only, only those teachers who felt they wanted to try this kind of teaching, and then always with the, uh, the uh, chance of some retreat to fall back on what they were doing they didn't feel too insecure. Well, as I recall, there were seven or eight teachers who began this work, and uh, during that first year, I think there were three who fell by the wayside. 
just felt they couldn't or didn't want to do it, and that was quite all right. And then the word began to spread from the youngsters who were having this work and finding it rewarding and satisfying. And the upshot of the thing was, and again, I think this was smart on Wilson's part, within a matter of about three or four years, uh, the situation had gotten to the point at moved in Murphy High School where Wilson had to order, had to put down his foot as a principal and say, there will be, there will be one or two sections of the traditional subject matter in English and social life, that by and large is the area where they did their work. It was about what you call a tight plot, a two or possibly three, two, I guess, on the algorithm scale. Uh, for those youngsters of parents who come new to the city and who would resent possibly or not understand what they're doing and resent if there were no choice in this case. But uh, uh, Wilson had his had a problem uh, keeping uh, those one or two sections to uh, talk to the students. One of his teachers, uh, who was a core teacher, is now doing her doctorate degree at Illinois, and I visit with her quite a bit, uh, so I have the inside on this, seen it from the point of view of a teacher as well, of course, as having heard about it from Mr. Wilson and also from having visited the school a couple of times. Well, so much for that. I might say that uh, uh, his fire insurance, he uh, utilized the standardized test and, uh, of course, had them for some years in the school and uh, did a job of pairing and equating and then measured gains uh, made in their core work with gains made in their standard subjects and uh, found that while the differences weren't large, they were in favor of the youngsters who had the core work. The youngsters knew that. Their parents knew it. Uh, that is, in part, I think, what well, probably helped to spread it somewhat. Now, uh, I'd like to, I mentioned Wrightstone earlier. I would like to uh, remind you, and I'm sure that's what I'm doing, of uh, a, a pioneer study that Wrightstone did in which the philosophy, the general point of view that has led us to the core course, or to the unified studies course, depending on where you are. Uh, this was back in, uh, oh, about 31. Wrightstone and I were fellow students, incidentally, at Columbia. I was a young instructor there at the time, working on my doctor's degree. Wrightstone happened to have a few dollars in his pocket, and he didn't have to be a, an assistant or an instructor. He was able to go to school full time. We were quite close friends. And I uh, will remember to my dying day, uh, Wrightstone coming over to my office as he was planning his doctoral dissertation after he had it pretty well planned, and telling me uh, rather sadly and, and uh, rather fearfully, I might say, that he was uh, persuaded in advance that he was going to lose most of his friends on the progressive education side of the fence. Because he was setting up a study, you've probably all read it, in which he compared the newer with more traditional practices in selected secondary schools. But he was, uh, right stone in his own mind, was persuaded in advance that the youngsters who were, were having this more functional type of teaching, it wasn't been packaged up in the core in those days, uh, but more rather than less problem-centered, with more rather than less in the way of pupil-teacher planning, the elements that have led us to the core in the larger blocks of time and so on. Well, he was persuaded in advance that these kids just wouldn't do as well on the standardized subject matter tests in uh, those the standard fields. But he fully expected them to do appreciably better in respect to the so-called intangibles that he was attempting to get measures on. Well, that was the uh, right stone's persuasion. Well, you, you probably read his book, and if you have, you know that at the secondary, he did at the elementary level, too, and that's about the same result. But at the high school level, uh, there were, as I recall it, 35 or 6 or 7, something like that, comparisons made, different subjects in which the comparison was made on the basis of gains in standardized tests, tests given at the beginning of the year and the end of the year, with a very tight pairing job done. Brightstone is exceedingly sharp in statistics. I've always admired him because I don't know from nothing in statistics. But Brightstone is a very sharp person. Well, he became head of the bureau there in New York City a few years after getting his degree, so he really had it on the ball. And uh, that's what he did then, was to take these, uh, these subjects, these uh, standardized subject matter tests, and uh, pair up his youngsters, do it very tightly on the basis of age, sex, uh, IQ, past achievements, so on, home background, and uh, in schools that were similar except uh, in, the, 
respect to this kind of teaching, and then compare the games. Well, you, uh, most of you, I'm sure, will recall, uh, perhaps you made it some little time ago, uh, what his results were. There was only one subject, one of the branches of higher mathematics, I forgot which one, the calculus, I think, uh, in which the games, the fall to spring games, made by those youngsters who were having the work in the traditional course were greater than the gains made by the kids in the newer type school. I simply mention this as sort of a granddaddy to the whole business, and I, this study has had more than a little to do uh, with many of us uh, in helping us to see that you are not really taking too much of a chance when you move over into core teaching, that the results have, have been building up. Well, that takes you way back there, you see, in the early 30s. Now, uh, another study I want to mention, this, uh, this relates now again to New York City and is one of the studies that was done and instanced without being cited in what I read earlier. The study by Wrightstone and Forlano, uh, J. Wayne Wrightstone and George Forlano in the Midwood High School in, in New York City. And this was reported in, I believe, 1940. I must refer to notes for this find this in uh, the magazine it's pretty hard to get hold of because most libraries don't have it. The magazine called High Point, which New York City publishes for its own secondary school teachers. And they don't particularly care whether it's circulated around the country or not. And I know that uh, I've been in universities where High Point uh, couldn't be found in the library. We have to have it at Illinois, unfortunately. Well, this was reported in December of 1948. And so the presumption is that the study was probably done in the years 45, 6, and 46, and 7. And it is based on uh, two, uh, uh, two core groups, that is, in two different years, successive years, and using the same technique that uh, Wrightstone had used earlier in his doctoral dissertation. In other words, tightly paired individuals. So that if uh, Curtis Howard were and I were of equivalent IQ and age and sex and uh, type of home, uh, and he happened to be in the core and I happened to be in the traditional course, we might be a pair. You see, uh, it was a very tight job. Uh, and this uh, this core in Midwood uh, runs three and sometimes four hours, and includes uh, what it is takes care of what they uh, used to take care of in English and social studies and also mathematics, which is a bit rare. Well, uh, as I say, uh, Wrightstone uh, paired these uh, people up uh, very closely and had in all uh, 94 pairs, which of course give you 188 uh, students, wouldn't it? And as I mentioned, before and after standardized tests were given to both groups of students, and the games made by each over the school year were compared. And the tests he used were the Cooperative English Test C1, Reading Comprehension, which measures vocabulary and speed and level of comprehension within a context which requires the subject to reason. And the Cooperative Test of Social Studies Abilities, which in regard to social science and materials, to organize them competently, to interpret them soundly, and to apply them intelligently. And I don't have in this particular note, I don't know if I brought it with me or not, uh, what, what the, uh, they, they used a standardized math test, but I uh, foolishly did not make a note of exactly which one. If you will refer, however, to High Points for December 1948, you will find uh, the test given. And then they used the, uh, the Wrightstone uh, scale of civic beliefs as another measure. Well, uh, here's what they found. On two of the three parts of the English test, and incidentally, that English test gets that speed of comprehension, level of comprehension, and vocabulary. On uh, two of those uh, three parts, uh, on all parts, the uh, gains made by the youngsters in the core courses were greater than the gains made by the youngsters in the traditional courses. This is right in the same high school now, you see, so that variable is controlled. But in the, in the case of speed, the difference was not great enough to be regarded as statistically significant. It was so at the 15% level of confidence. But in, re in regard to level of comprehension and in respect to vocabulary, 
uh, the results were significant when viewed from the point of view of statistics. On all four parts of the social studies test, and one part of that test you may remember uh, deals with obtaining facts, another with organizing facts, another with interpreting facts, and another in applying generalizations. On all four of those parts, the youngsters in the core work made gains which were not only greater, but were statistically significantly greater than was true of the gains made by the youngsters uh, in the standard uh, core. The same thing was uh, true of the work in mathematics, the gains made by the two groups. Those in the core group made greater gains. On uh, civic uh, beliefs, the gain was also in favor of the core group, and in this instance was uh, significant statistically. Now, uh, this uh, study has been repeated, uh, to my knowledge, at least three times. Repeated uh, once by uh, Reichstone and Polano, the same two, with very much the same results, all very closely similar. And uh, the, the techniques were taken by Bernice Capehart, who is now superintendent of schools down in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, but used to be the director of guidance for Oak Ridge. You know, that new community set up down there in the hills for atomic energy purposes. Well, uh, Cape Hart, uh, a new school, and they started out with this uh, philosophy, but they were smart enough to lay in their fire insurance, and so Cape Hart had utilized the uh, technique of uh, Wrightstone and Solano to test out and was able to do it there in their high school, right within the same school, uh, with very uh, closely similar results on both recitations. Well, that's the, uh, the Cape Hart business. Now, uh, this so far uh, pertains to the, uh, to the uh, senior high school, as you have noted. Uh, if you don't happen to have, well, yes, I didn't bring it with me. Yes, I did too. If you don't happen to have this publication, those of you that are working at the junior high school level, I would certainly lay it in. Uh, you can get it by writing to the Kalamazoo Board of Education. And uh, the last time I was in contact with them in Kalamazoo, they were not charging for it. They should. They ought to charge you a dollar or so for it. Uh, this is entitled, uh, How Much Did They Grow? Now, uh, I have been a consultant in uh, Kalamazoo on various matters. It has happened the last few years. And know the community fairly well. Matter of fact, I have an aunt and uncle living there, so I was, was there for the time when I was a small child. Kalamazoo, as I recall it, has three junior high schools, one senior high school, central high school, and I'm guessing now, but something in the nature of 11 to a dozen or 12 or 13 elementary schools. Well, in all three of their junior high schools, uh, enough of the teachers became persuaded some years ago of the desirability of the core course to get the thing installed so completely that there is no alternative to the core course in any of the three years in any of those three junior high schools. Well, uh, back here about, uh, well, you know, when the attacks on education began really rolling back there in 50 and 51, why, of course, the backwash was felt in uh, Kalamazoo as it was felt all over the United States, and there were parents who began to murmur and uh, utilize the anecdotal approach. You know, I know a boy who, or I know a girl who can't spell, who can't read, or can't do something else. Incidentally, I noticed in the last NEA journal, I was really sorry to see that, uh, there's a well-written article uh, by Gladys Denny Schultz, which is very laudatory of the core, but the kind of evidence she offers is the anecdotal sort of proof. She offers her own daughter and some, one or two other youngsters. Uh, that's dangerous. You can find anything you want to. I live 20 miles out in the country, and every morning I drive by a pasture where there's a horse that has three legs. It's been turned out there, a humane farmer will kill him, this horse had a leg injured and was amputated at the knee. If I could generalize from that, I know a horse has got three legs. And I could generalize from that that all the horses in Clyde County, Illinois, have got three legs, which of course isn't true at all. So I a little regret that just a little bit, even though I like very much, of course, uh, uh, what she reports. But it's dangerous. This anecdotal business is dangerous. And, but he works uh, the opposition is certainly used. I know a boy who. And mainly, that's the stalking trade of uh, men like my colleagues, uh, Bester and others, uh, who will tell you about a boy they know and will ignore the mass evidence. Well, 
Uh, in Kalamazoo, uh, back there, 1551, there were these murmurs that they can't sell like they used to, and they can't write, and they can't do this, and they can't do that. Uh, Kalamazoo uh, happens to have a very sharp uh, director of research. I can't think of his name. He's a Dutchman about so high. I know him, but I can't call his name. And uh, they've got a director of curriculum that I think is one of the best in the country. Uh, very professional people. And they said, well, we're getting these uh, murmurs. Uh, we have been derelict. You're not laying your fire insurance. We owe it to the people of this community, no less than to our own professional conscience, to get what the facts are. And so uh, they sat down with groups of teachers over the city uh, during that school year and uh, made a search for, try to come as close as they could to finding the kinds of standardized tests that are ordinarily used throughout the country come as close to approximating what they were trying to do as possible. And uh, they found the uh, test in the, at all three of the grade levels. And of course, the standardized tests give you norms for September and uh, you know, monthly norms and whatnot. And what they did then was to uh, go on the assumption that the generality of kids in Kalamazoo are probably innately no brighter or no less bright than the generality of youngsters in the many schools where these tests were standardized. I think they were conservative in doing that, but what little I know about test instruction, in my observation that it tends to be the average or better than average schools that will offer themselves as subjects in the standardizing of the test. And I, uh, my own feeling, I can't prove this, but my own feeling is that you aren't really comparing your youngsters with the generality of youngsters the country over when you compare, look at the norms that are published in standardized tests. But be that as it may, uh, they made the assumption that their youngsters were probably a no brighter or no duller, and of course they had all their kids uh, involved. And what they did then was to apply, give these tests in the fall of the year, and again in the spring, a couple of weeks before school closed, and compare the gains made in Kalamazoo uh, with the uh, differences between the norms for those months that were published by the textbook the publisher. Now I, rather than uh, wade through this, uh, I've summarized uh, that study uh, in a paragraph or so here that I think gives the essence of it. <coughs> uh, the test they used, one was the Iowa Silent Reading Test which measures the pupil's proficiency in respect to rate and level of comprehension, word meaning, paragraph comprehension, sentence meaning, alphabetizing, and use of the index. And they also use the Iowa Language Abilities Test, which measures in regard to spelling, word meaning, language usage, grammatical form, sentence sense, capitalization, and punctuation within a context which appraises proficiency in the use of the English language. And uh, they applied a geography test, which was part two of the progressive test in social-related sciences, which yields measures in respect to maps and geographic terms and the effects of geography on man. Uh, for a history test, they utilized part one of the Stanford Achievement Test in Social Studies. They also utilized the Brown-Woody Civics Test, which measures, measures civic vocabulary, civic information, and requires the pupil to apply the principles of civics to practical situations. And then they used the Iowa Work Study Skills Test, which measures skills in map reading, use of references, use of index, use of the dictionary, and the reading of graphs, charts, and tables. So you can see they got at things that some of our critics are saying our kids just don't learn. Now here are the results. Compared with the presumed generality of youngsters over the USA, the Kalamazoo pupils made gains in scores, which were nearly twice as great on the reading test, they were better on the language abilities test, not quite as good on the geography test, over 50% better on the history test, about the same on the civics test, and appreciably better on the work study skills test. Now this differs somewhat from grade level to level. If I uh, want to take the time to go into this report and dig it out, what you would see is that the gain, with almost no exception, there may be one, I can't think what it is, Gains favor the youngsters, this is true all the way through. The gains favor the young, except the geography, where they were about the same. Favor the kids in Kalamazoo, the core group. But those gains, those differences in gains, get greater 
they tend to be appreciably greater for the ninth grade than they were for the seventh, which suggests that the longer youngsters have experience with the core course, and all the youngsters had had at least, were at least in their third year of core, that the longer they have had core experience, the more they will tend to excel the games made by other youngsters. That is at least a, a tenable hypothesis, isn't it, from, from the facts at hand. Well, there's the, that study at the, at the junior high school level. Now, uh, you're probably also familiar with the work that ran for 19 years in respect to success at the college level. Uh, how do uh, some of our academic critics, and I refer now to some of my own colleagues, are quite vociferous in uh, saying that, or implying at any rate, that the core course is about the lowest form of anti-intellectualism that the educators have yet been able to devise. One of them calls it social swap. Uh, and they are fairly confident that youngsters who have had uh, that uh, sort of work in high school do not do as well in college as youngsters who've had the traditional work. Well, it happens that Morgantown, West Virginia, afforded a pretty good laboratory situation. There are two high schools in that community, both publicly supported. The one has had uh, the core approach uh, utilized uh, since the late 20s, one of the very early places. And the other of the two schools uh, is a school uh, in which uh, the college preparatory type of teaching, and the way the academic people would like to have it done. They don't fool around with people teaching requirements. The teacher tells them what to do and they do it. They have a, quite a bit in the way of checkup tests and so on. Well, let me read from the study. This ran for, what they did there was to pair up youngsters from the two schools who went to the University of West Virginia. And for 19 years, they were able to make these comparisons. Now I want to read from this study. This is by Kermit Cook, reported in the school review. You probably all read it. I hope you have. I hope I brought it with me, too. Yeah, here it is. Uh, let me read uh, a little bit from this. Uh, in the, uh, we'll call this School A. This is the one that has uh, their version of the core. The School of Educational Program is built on the belief that high school pupils learn most effectively when they are provided with learning situations involving life problems, which is uh, anathema, you see, to some of our critics. I think that's the surest way for youngsters not to achieve uh, intellectual development. And I think they're quite sincere in their belief. They just haven't looked at the research at all. Of course, after that occupational disease, all of us professors have hand and children. Just because I'm a professor in one field, it's pretty easy to believe that I know everything about everything. And uh, we're more or less like that way. Well, we make asses out of ourselves, of course, and we feel that way. Curriculum content and all the recognized learning experiences are found in the activities of the school as a civic and social unit. These sources are drawn on and organized by the teachers and the students in the meaningful problems designed to develop in the students reflective and critical thinking, basic skills in learning and expression, and desirable social adjustment. Students share with the faculty the responsibility for determining the school's policies, particularly as these relate to general activities and to control the school. The basic elements of method are teacher-prepared and teacher-pupil-prepared units, the workshop, the individual conference, and the group conference. Now the other school we'll call School B may be classified, they say here, as a typical public high school in an urban community. Because of its proximity to the campus of West Virginia University and the predominant professional and business point of view represented among the school patrons, they were very generous here, instead of saying a lot of these uh, parents are professors who know all the answers and won't permit any deviation from traditional. That's really what they mean. Ask Curtis Howe, who used to be in our university high school, University of Illinois, how easy it is to do something different uh, with some of these people. It's very difficult. Well, no charge for that. That's fine. Uh, because of this proximity, its curriculum and methods are largely dominated by the traditional college preparatory purpose. The curriculum is mainly arranged in typewritten or printed courses of study, and curriculum content and activities are found for the most part in textbooks, in teacher-prepared outlines, and in limited supplementary materials. The general philosophy of the curriculum and of the teaching methods 
is that the most desirable learning situations are teacher planned, teacher directed, and teacher evaluated. The basic elements of method are teacher prepared assignments, class recitations, and subject matter examinations given at frequent intervals and at the end of each semester. This little bunking business that's hauled into the sense of our place. Now, this study, uh, as I said, that ran for 19 years, uh, beginning in the uh, in 1928 and running through 1946. They're still collecting the evidence, but they brought them together uh, and uh, made this report here a couple of years back by Kermit W. Cook. Incidentally. The students were paired on the basis of sex, intelligence, quotient, chronological age, and high school marks. Now, uh, the uh, what they did was to there were two three kinds of comparisons two really, but one divided into two parts. For one thing, and you know, of course, that in most uh, colleges and universities, I told you in the most youngsters take pretty much the same sort of work during their first four semesters, their first two years, uh, their general education. Well, uh, this is quite true, apparently, at West Virginia University, and what they did, among other things, one of the things they did, was to uh, compare these two pair groups that is, person to person, not pair group, in terms of the honor points that had been earned uh, in their academic work during the first four semesters. And uh, they reported here in the form of, uh, of, their, of the mean honor points. Now, here's what we get. Uh, school A, which is the one uh, that uh, utilized the core approach. School B is the other one. In the first semester, the, uh, the mean number of honor points uh, made by youngsters from school A was 15.640. And uh, the mean number of honor points made by the youngsters from school B was 14.238. That's a difference of one point, uh, what is it, uh, about four. It's not much of a difference, although honor points are pretty hard to get and a little difference in size. Now there's a difference of 1.4. In the next semester, the second semester, the youngsters from school A in the core school, their mean honor points were 18.536. The other group was 15.846. There's a difference of 2.4 honor points, which is really quite appreciable. In the third semester, the youngsters from school A, their, their mean honor points, 20.886. The other youngsters, 17.070, which is a difference of 3.8. Still going on up. You see, again, it's almost great progression, isn't it? It was one greater, and now it's 1.4 greater, even uh, accelerated a little bit. And then we come to the fourth semester, and the mean number of honor points made by the youngsters from school A, the core school, was 23.703, and the other group, 18.697, giving you a difference of 5.0 honor points, uh, which, uh, again, that trend just kept right on going there. Well, there's the honor point story. And of course, this is in terms of grades which are given by uh, university professors, the same professors in the same classes in the same university. Now, the other comparison had to do with the, <clears throat> with the uh, percent of semester hours taken which were successfully passed, passed with, completed with passing marks. And uh, in a sense, this is two comparisons uh, because they were able to utilize all the subjects taken for four semesters, but for the first two semesters, they were able to utilize the fields of English, mathematics, science, and social studies, precisely the areas where we get the sharpest criticism of the new kind of teaching from our academic brothers. Well, let's take the first comparison first. During the first semester, this is a comparison now based on all subjects taken by the two groups. Uh, the youngsters from school A, the core school, uh, successfully completed 84.33% of their work, the other 81.19, which is a difference of 3.14 in favor of school A. The second semester, the youngsters uh, from school A successfully passed 88.92%, the other 86.53%, a difference of 0.239. In the third semester, the uh, school A group completed 93.07% of its work successfully, the other 87.91, a difference of 5.16 percentage points, again in favor of school A. 
the fourth semester, the youngsters from School A, 96.05 of their work successfully completed. The other 91.61, difference is 0.4.44. Now the other comparison interests me, I think, perhaps as much if not more than any of the others, because here they have narrowed it down to the academic subjects which are, which do deal with uh, the intellectual development of young people and the areas in which if there were a retrogression or sorry performances, there would indeed be real reason for serious criticism that I don't think we could, we could uh, crawl out from under at all. Well, now here's the story in English. In the first, uh, during the first semester, the youngsters from School A uh, completed uh, 86.34 of the percent of their work. The other youngsters, 84.75, a difference of 1.59 percentage points, almost a little different, one, one and a half percent. Second semester, the story was 93.66 for school A and 88.47 for the other, a difference of 5.19 percentage points, which I think is appreciable. That's English. Mathematics. During the first semester, the youngsters from School A, the core group, completed 67.40% of its work successfully. The other 61.19, a difference of 6.21 in favor of School A, the core group. An appreciable difference. Second semester, the comparative figures were for A, 67.44, which is about the same as for the first, slightly greater. The other is retrogressed. Instead of 61, it's now 58.22 a difference of 9.22 percentage points in favor of the core group. In sciences, the story for school A was 82.93 in the first semester, 77.31 in the second semester, and there you get a regression, you see, in science. Uh, in the other school, it was 87.47, and in the second, 82.06, likewise a regression. They both went back about 5 percentage points. In social studies, uh, the first semester, 81.79 for school A. The second semester, let me take that all back. I read this from the wrong way. Uh, the, first, the first semester for science, 82.93 for the school A, and the second semester was 87.47. It gained, and the other also gained. And then when you read it the other way across, I'm reading these not the way they're put down here, but another way, and I got followed up. Comparing school A and school B. During the first semester, it was school A, 82.93, and for school B, 77.31, which is a difference of 5.6 in favor of school A. Second semester, 87.47 for school A, and 82.06 for school B, a difference of 5.41, again, in favor of school A. And the social sciences, and here the differences were really large. The others, I think, were appreciable. During the first semester, uh, school A uh, youngsters completed successfully 81.79% of its work, or their work. School B, 58.37, a difference of 23.42 percentage points. During the second semester, the school A group, 88.67% percentage, percent of its work. The other, 71.13, a difference of 17.54. Well, now this has run, uh, you see, for 19 years. It isn't just one group and it's youngsters from the same city going to the same university and on the basis of uh, pretty uh, tightly uh, paired uh, groups. Now I have a feeling, I felt a twitch go through this audience a moment ago, uh, and that always tells me I'd better hush up and sit down. But I am going to say very quickly two other things. Uh, these uh, improvements that we see here, uh, I think are reflect it, 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 but more for core than for others, the general improvements going on. Uh, the study done and recorded by Siler, the official recorder of the University of Illinois, for example, where they compared the entering classes of uh, 30, what was it, to 5, 6, and 7, with the entering class of 49, polluted only by 18 veterans, so practically no veterans in that, uh, in either of those groups. And what Siler found, this is an accidental finding, he wasn't studying this at all, he was studying how well do, do these predictive measures stack up now in terms of how they used to way back when. But what he found was that the young people uh, coming more recently from the Illinois high schools, 
You've got grade point ratios that are larger in every single college and division of the University of Illinois than was true in the other previous groups. And still we have critics, the most vociferous, I think, in the country, from the University of Illinois, saying that the schools have deteriorated in terms of their preparation for college. Either they don't know the study of their institution or they're unwilling to face the facts. Well, yeah, I don't know which. And then I assume, of course, you all noticed uh, what was published here recently in the press and in the school review in detail in uh, March of 1956, where they went back to uh, look at the GED tests again, you know, where they compared 1943 with 19, what was it, 55, and uh, where they found that youngsters, uh, the more recent, now more recently in high school, did better on all of those tests, and quite appreciably so on all except, I think, the one about what the social studies was the great again. Well, Evelyn, I've talked too long, but that's an occupational disease, and I, I, I'm a bit incurable. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yes, that's in the school review for, oh, I have a note here, March 51. Now this is, uh, this is good ammunition, I think. We all ought to have it in our files. You're a good court student, but of course you will be negatively critical if you feel that way. Won't you? <laughs> Go ahead and shoot. <laughs> uh, well, was there any way of comparing your teacher's competency to the study? You always have that. You can't have a teacher doing, the same teacher doing both. They, they believe in one or the other. And there's always that, that variable is largely uncontrolled. But it's what they regard, the teachers they keep, the teachers they regard as their good teachers. I think the one who probably came the closest to it would be Wrightstone study in, uh, in Midwood, because he is the sharpest of any of these in my humble judgment, and uh, statistically, and would be the most uh, self-critical. No, uh, and I don't think that's valid because you don't believe in both of them. Uh, Evelyn Looking here uh, is an excellent core teacher, but I'll bet you she wouldn't be any better than, much better than average as a traditional teacher. Not now. Maybe she would have been six, eight, ten years ago. Because she believes in it. <laughs> and uh, uh, you, you teach uh, the way you believe, don't you? So you can't put on the coat and say, to now today I believe in traditional, and then tomorrow I put it on next semester, and now I believe in core. I don't think it's possible to get that control. I wish we could. I don't think you can. Might conceivably. But uh, I think when you get your, your paired youngsters and experienced teachers, that in Midwood, for example, uh, I know, and I'm knowing Wrightstone personally, I've talked to them about this. While he won't put it down on paper and say these teachers were were equivalent, he thinks they are. It's best he knows. But he'd be the first to admit we don't really know. There's no way for me to really appraise you as a teacher uh, compared to Mr. Strum here, let's say, or to myself. There's so many subtleties in the thing. But it's not me. It may well be. I think, uh, I think the point's well taken. It may, may very well be. I, uh, my own feeling is there's nothing sacred about a type of uh, curriculum organization 
that what's important is the teacher. And what that teacher does with youngsters, I happen to feel that having two hours with them gives them a chance to do more than if they got one hour. But uh, we, you we all know teachers. I could name you some Jacksonville High School. I can give you some there in English that are achieving, I think, very excellent results in uh, under the old package, but it isn't traditional teaching. It's the youngsters are in the purposing and the planning and the self-evaluating. They're using the essence of the core approach, but without having two hours to do it in. I think what's important mainly about these data, actually, is the assurance they give that kids don't lose. There's no reason there to presuppose that youngsters are losing out in any way, either when they go to college or on standardized tests. Now I think we've got to be, as, the, as I think he properly implies, very cautious, very cautious about our interpretation. You notice what Wright Stone said in writing to the board? He said they, they do as well, maybe a little better, whereas his results show that they are not only sizably better, but statistically significant. They are different. But our critics of uh, the uh, approach also very critical. Yes, I think so. Uh, they, um, I always think in that connection of our rhetoric work at the University of Illinois and the story that Provost Larson tells, who used to be head of the English department, of the model exam that was drawn up uh, by the senior professors for the use of the rest, the use of the model, I which the grade, and one of the young fellows came in, didn't know it was a model, and got hold of the paper and flunked it. And Larson says that's a true story. <laughs> So they may very well have uh, a more confidence in that kind of exam, and of course, if they're very carefully done, they can have a fair degree of reliability. Well, that was actually you were uh, testing on a kind of exam that fit in perhaps better with one type of thinking or objective. Well, yes, in that respect, this.